I want to start with a couple of questions. What is so special about us, if anything? Why would we think we're special anyhow? And who are we special to, if anyone? These are the kind of questions that we all ask ourselves from time to time. But it can be very easy to become persuaded by some who would say that as a species and as individuals, we are not anything special at all. And there seem to be more and more people expressing those opinions and doing so in louder and more strident ways, basically saying that we don't have any ultimate worth and value. And so basically we're nothing and we're no one. These views usually stem from those who put forward the theory of evolution that basically says we're all here on planet Earth because of lots of luck and lots and lots of time. For example, there is the influential and really infamous professor from Oxford, Richard Dawkins, who writes in one of his books, humans have always wondered about the meaning of life. The fact is life has no higher purpose than to perpetuate the survival of DNA. Well, when I read that, I thought, well, at least he thinks we have some purpose, unless, of course, we fail to produce any children, in which case, presumably, our lives are totally worthless. And it's not just some scientists who are saying these kind of things and writing about them in their books. In the 20th century, there was a very famous French philosopher who was well known for being an atheist by the name of Jean-Paul Sartre. And he said the following, man is a useless passion. It is meaningless that we live and it is meaningless that we die. Well, he really knew how to cheer a crowd up, didn't he, with, with that kind of statement. There are those in the media and in film who are, are very influential today, aren't there? And there's a very controversial film director called Woody Allen, who uh, he said this, I firmly believe that life is meaningless. I'm not alone in thinking this. And there have been many great minds, far superior to mine, that have come up with that conclusion. Well, all of these quotes present pretty grim stuff. But if they're right, if what they're saying is true, then we just have to expect it, uh, sorry, accept it, whether it's grim or not. We have to face up to the fact that our lives have virtually no meaning and then they are therefore of virtually no value. And in that case, it would mean that there is absolutely nothing special about us at all. We shouldn't think there is and no one should think it either. And maybe you've been on the receiving end of these sorts of statements at a personal level too. Perhaps you've got a partner who is regularly putting you down and saying how useless you are or how rubbish you are. It could be that you've had parents that have done the same. Maybe you have friends or work colleagues who from time to time will, will make those kind of statements towards you. We have a, a family friend who's slightly disabled in one hand. And I remember her sharing with us once that ever since she was a little girl, her mum had been down on every single thing that she tried to do. She said to her mum when she was 17, I'm going to take driving lessons. And Mum's response was instantly, why bother? You'll never pass your test. And that can be very demoralising. And uh, that particular friend really has had her self-esteem knocked right out of her. And it really has effect, and still does affect her self-worth even today. But are those people right? Are those people that we may know who say those kind of things correct? Are those uh, big voices in science, in, in the media, in philosophy, are they correct? in the statements they, uh, they espouse so confidently. Well, the Bible says very, very clearly a most definite no to that question. They are most certainly not right 
in the things that they say. And I think deep down, every one of us does know that actually life does have meaning and human beings are special, even if we're not sure why we're special. The truth is, you see, we all have certain qualities, certain marks, certain characteristics that are intrinsic to mankind that make us very special in the grand scheme of things. There are things within us, things inbuilt, that go into making us what it is to be human. And humans, in so many ways, are unique in all of the creation. And it will hopefully do us all some good to spend some time thinking about the specialness of human beings, about the specialness of you and of me. And there are far more characteristics that are special about us than perhaps we would think. This morning's message, my original intention, was it for it to be a one-off. But as I began to study this subject, I realised I'd actually need a second message. And that was all right, because I thought I could preach it on another occasion. But then as I studied more, I realised that actually I was going to need a third message. And so this morning is part one of three. And God willing, part two will be on the 18th of April and part three will be on the 2nd of May. So I'm glad to say there isn't too long a gap between each of the messages. And in all, we're going to consider 14 points in these three messages. I'm sure you're all mightily relieved that I didn't decide to do 14 points in just one message. Uh, we would have been here, well, until it's time for the evening service, I suppose. Now, I would say that although I've got 14 points over these three messages, there are probably others that I just haven't been able to think of. And there are those with a far greater and deeper knowledge of these things than I've got, who could probably preach a single message on each of the 14 points. But before we get into point number one, there are just uh, three more quick things that I want to say. The first one is that most of our focus in these three messages will be on the last couple of verses in Genesis chapter one, and then a large section of Genesis chapter two. And then secondly, each of the headings, each of the 14 headings contains the word man. Now, please don't think in any way that I'm using the word man to be chauvinistic. I hope I'm not that at all, but I'm using it in what's known as the generic sense, which just means in the collective, in the inclusive sense of the word mankind. And then thirdly, None of the 14 headings, and this might surprise you a bit, specifically highlight that one of the reasons we are special is because God loves us. And the reason for that is because God's love for us can most definitely be seen in every one of those 14 points. And I hope that's something that will be noticeable to each one of us as we begin to work through. So then, we're special because, first of all, mankind is a created man. God made us. Look with me again at verses 26 and verses 27 of Genesis 1. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Those words are telling us very simply that human beings have not always existed. 
any more than this world, this universe has always existed. God gave us a beginning. God brought about that beginning. Humans, male and female, are created beings. And that by itself makes us special. We're not here by blind chance multiplied by gazillions of years. That notion is utterly daft, however cleverly some try to dress it up. We're thinking about having a new drive uh, on uh, the front of our house here in Dunstable. Now I could order a quantity of bricks and cement and I could have them delivered out the front, but however much rain then fell, however much wind blew, however much ice froze, however much sun shone and however much time passed, they would never by themselves turn into a new driveway. Cool, if they did, I could save myself probably quite a lot of money, but that could never happen. And to believe otherwise is to live in fantasy land. No, this world is only here, human beings are only here, and you and I are only here because Almighty God willed it and he brought it about. It says right in the start of his book, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, probably one of the most famous verses in the Bible, in the beginning, God created. Like it or not, and a growing number in our land don't like it at all, that is the plain and simple truth. It's not my truth or your truth. Let's be quite honest, my truth and your truth don't really matter one jot. What does matter is the truth. God created us. You see, we're not here just by luck. We're not even ultimately here because of our parents. And we're certainly not here because of ourselves. We're here because of him. We're here because of our divine maker. Which is why the view that humans are worth nothing is not only extremely sad, it's also totally wrong and totally dishonoring to the Lord. We're marked with the designer label, one that proves that we were created and therefore that there is a creator. Now, maybe you're one of those people who like to have stuff and wear clothes that have the designer label on them. As a teenager, I rem remember insisting that my school bag had to have Adidas emblazoned on the side of it. Nothing else would do. At the time, it seemed so important. Mind you, that was the limit for me. We could never afford designer clothes. And I'll even let you into a little secret. Yes, a little secret. I usually had to wear my older brother's hand-me-downs. And those hand-me-downs, they didn't have designer labels on either. I might as well tell you that I've never really gone in for clothes that have a famous label on them, I'll be quite honest. I resent paying all that extra money just so I can give a company a free advert while I walk down the street wearing their uh, attire. But for some people, they just have to have designer labels on. Not only their bag, but their shoes, their trousers, their skirts, their dresses, their hoodies, their jackets, their jumpers, their joggers, their coats, you name it. And if you're one of those people, here's a name for you. Here's a name much more impressive than Burberry, 
Knight, Reebok, North Face, Levi, Ray-Ban, Ben Sherman, Gap, Wrangler, Prady, Armana, Armani, Superdry, DNKY, and all the others that I've missed, and all of them all put together. Here's a name, G-O-D, God. You have his label on right now and you didn't even have to pay a penny for it. And there are so many wonderful examples that we could give that demonstrate that so plainly. Let's just mention one. Our bodies are apparently made up of at least 75 trillion cells. 75 trillion of them. That's the least that we have. And every one of them is like an incredibly complex and highly organized factory. Listen to the following description of the human cell by Dr. Gary Bates. He writes, they are constantly retrieving, processing and restoring food. They are producing and storing energy without overheating the delicate temperature sensitive molecular mechanisms. Meanwhile, an elaborate communication network allows constant communication both within and without the cell. The transport system and waste disposal systems are a model of efficiency. All of this machinery is manufactured to high precision from the raw materials of nutrient molecules. Well, we don't necessarily need to understand all the intricacies of what he's saying there, but machines, we know, they don't come about by themselves. They don't come about because of unguided chance. They come about because they have intelligent design that's come from an intelligent designer. So you see, if you've never realized it ever before, God made us. But you know, the Bible teaches us far more than that simple fact that we were created. Our place in the created order, that makes us very special too. And there are at least four things in Genesis 1 and 2 that, that show us our place in God's created order that indicate more of why we as created beings are special. One is that a conversation took place. Everything else that God made was just commanded into being. God spoke it and it happened. However, just before God made man, a consultation took place. And it's very significant that no consultation was needed before God created either the birds or the fish or the land animals. Look down at verse 25 with me. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said. There's a clear contrast with every other created being. With them, God just did it. With us, he spoke about it first. So who took part in this conversation? God was speaking. But let's not make the mistake that God was speaking probably to his angels. No, no. Not only does the text not say that, but angels are never ever said in the whole of the Bible to be involved in creating this world or anything in it. Creating is something that only God does. It couldn't have been the Lord speaking to angels anyway, because he wasn't going to make mankind in the image of angels. He was going to make mankind in the image of himself. Verse 26 tells us about this divine consultation. And verse 27 tells us that God's will was straight away carried out afterwards. 
Yes, I know it's true that sometimes we joke that talking to yourself is the first sign of madness. There may not be much hope for some of us if that's the case. But while that may be true for us, it certainly is not true for God. The word for God that is used here is the word Elohim. And this is the plural form of the Hebrew word for God. And it's one that recurs again and again throughout the Bible. And here we have, in effect, just the very first hint of God being a triune being. He is one God in three divine persons. Hebrews 1 says of the Father in relation to the Son, through whom he created the world. For God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, there was nothing unnatural about being in dialogue together. And what they spoke about, amazingly, was us. Secondly, God got everything ready. Genesis 2 opens up with more detail of God's creation of mankind. Have you ever noticed the things that God made before he created mankind? Basically, everything we need to live. Light, air, water, heat, vegetation. And it was all put in place before God made human beings. Of course, in our small way, we do something similar, don't we? Many of you know my daughter, Abby, and her husband, Tom. They are expecting their second baby in just 12 days time. And of course, they've done lots of things to get ready for baby's arrival. They've had to buy stuff. They've had to tidy up and clean up other stuff, all kinds of clothes, all kind of equipment, uh, bedding, bed, uh, carrying basket, uh, things for washing, nappies and all the paraphernalia that go uh, along with those. So that when that little baby bo boy is born, everything will be ready. It all shows their love and care for the new child. And the way God created the world shows his love and care for mankind. You know, scientists talk about uh, this and, and use a rather grand phrase, the anthropic principle. And they use that to describe planet Earth. Anthropos is the Greek word for mankind. And when they use that phrase, they're simply meaning that Everything in this earth is just right for us to live. We have everything needful. One science writer put it like this. There is no doubt the universe has been designed for our benefit. It's tailor-made for mankind. How good, how loving God was to make it just like that. Thirdly, he saved the best till last. We know how special humans are because creating us was the final work that God did before he rested on the seventh day. Have you ever noticed children, how often they save a part of their meal till last? Yes, I know that in some cases it's those vegetables that they don't like uh, and they hope that they can wear the parents down by, by just refusing to eat that they're greens or whatever it happens to be. But sometimes the food that children leave on their plate until last is not their worst part of the meal, it's their best part of the meal and they want to save the best till last. Maybe some adults do exactly the same thing as well. Well, that is what God did when he created this world and everything in it he saved the best till last. Mankind was the pinnacle of his creation, the best of his creative works. He made us. And fourthly, there's much more detail in these portions of Genesis 
about human beings, our creation, our purpose, our function, than there is about anything else that God made. It's a bit like if, say, you bought a newspaper and on the front page, it was uh, virtually all about Her Majesty the Queen. And then in the tiny bottom right hand corner was a little bit about her dogs. Now, what would that tell you? It would surely tell you that Her Majesty is far more important than the corgis, which, of course, she is. And by giving so much more detail about man, God has shown how very special we are, how very special we are to him. So that's our first heading. Man is a created man. And then secondly, and more briefly, mankind is a dust man. Yes, he is. Look with me at the beginning of verse 7. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground. I don't know if you can remember that very old song, My Old Man's a Dustman. He wears a, a dustman's hat. Well, it's quite true that the oldest man of all of human beings, our original father, Adam, he was a dustman. No, not in the sense that he collected the bins once a fortnight, but in the sense that he came from the dust. That's where he originated from. That was his place of origin. And it's important for us to know, isn't it, where we came from. So many people today are completely ignorant uh, of the fact of where we came from, and, and their lives are robbed of so much as a result of it. They're robbed of the specialness that is true of us because of who made us and how. But you might be puzzled and think, but yes, but if we're just made from dust, we can't be very special at all. Ah, well, we didn't read all of verse seven there, did we? Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living creature. Yes, God did indeed use dust or soil or earth to create the first human being. His name reminds us of that. Adam means earth or ground. We are, after all, we're physical beings. And the basic uh, chemical elements of the ground are the very same elements that are what makes you and I to be physical beings. That's where we came from, the ground. And as God's judgment statement makes very clear over in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve sinned and fell away from God, that's where we will return to. God said, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. In one sense, knowing that we're just dust should really humble us, shouldn't it? Think of Abraham speaking to God about the deliverance of the few righteous people he hoped there would be found in the evil cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He said, behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Now, it doesn't do us any harm, especially in our dealings with God, to realise that we need to be very humble before him. However, in another sense, the way God made Adam and the material he used to do it pictures to us a very careful potter using his own hands to skillfully make those that he would love. And what a thought that is, that when God could merely have spoken Adam into being and then Eve after him, he didn't. And what he did was not just to do something else, to throw in a bit of variety into his creative work. No, he wasn't doing just something else. He was doing something more, something special. The way God chose to make Adam elevates us humans and not the opposite. It doesn't in any way put us down. 
God's personal activity that was involved in creating mankind wasn't involved in creating anything else. And that is very noteworthy. And not only did God personally form man from the dust of the ground, he then did something else personal as well. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. God seemed to go out of his way to make us special. How special is that? And then our third and final point for this morning is that mankind is an image man. Yes, a created man, a dust man, and also an image man. It is truly ironic when you think that so many people today are so concerned about their image, about looking good, about looking important to others, that they needn't worry because their image is already huge. Their image is all ready amazingly good without them even realizing it look at verse 26 of chapter one again then god said let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth Unlike any of God's other creatures, we have been made in the image of God. There's a huge contrast in Genesis 1 that when God created the vegetation and the birds and the fish and the animals, it said that he made them all after its kind or after their kind. This phrase occurs no less than 10 times between verse 11 and verse 25 of chapter 1. But when the Lord created Adam, he didn't make him after their kind or after its kind. He made him after God's kind. He made Adam in the image and likeness of himself. When the Apostle Paul was preaching in Athens, he quoted a Greek philosopher named Epimenides, who correctly said, for we are his, that is God's offspring. And of course, offspring have the likeness of their parents, don't they? Yes, there are, of course, many physical similarities between us and the animals. And that's because we have the same designer. It's not because, as some say, we have the same ancestor. We're unique, though in God's creation because we and we alone are made in God's image. You know, you and I should be absolutely astounded that this is true. To think that we, we have certain traits, we have certain characteristics that are like God. Not that the Bible ever teaches that we're somehow mini gods. There's no such thing. We are humans. We have flesh and blood, whereas God is spirit. And yet, when we look at ourselves in the mirror each morning, whatever else we may see, and it may not be a, a pretty sight, we see something about God that's about us. But it is important to say that the image of God that we have has been marred, has been spoilt. It's not, if you like, as good as it was when Adam and Eve were created. And what caused it to be spoilt was Adam and Eve's sin against God's command. When, and, and in doing so, when they rebelled, allowed sin to enter and spoil them and the world and that's how it's been ever since and that's why we are sinners today we've inherited their sin and we demonstrate that their sin is in us by the things we say by the way we behave again and again and again and you can read all about the fall of man in genesis chapter 3 of course I suppose you could say we're a bit like a badly cracked mirror. 
you can still see your reflection in it, but it's spoilt, it's distorted. One thing this means is that as a species, we're actually the very opposite of what evolution teaches. We haven't evolved, we haven't progressed upwards, we've actually devolved, we've progressed, we've gone downwards, backwards, we've fallen away from how our creator intended us to be and from the relationship that we were intended to have with him. However, though we were all spoiled by sin and are still now spoiled by sin, we do still have something of the image of God within us. James in chapter 3 verse 9 of his New Testament letter says in the present tense of people who are made in the likeness of God. And not only do sinners like us still have, still carry God's image, but the message of the gospel teaches that when we go to Christ seeking forgiveness through his death on our behalf upon the cross, he doesn't merely take away our sin and make us clean inside. He also makes us like himself. He begins to do that on the day of our conversion, and he continues to do that as he sanctifies us throughout our Christian lives. The New Testament speaks of God choosing what was going to happen to those who would be saved. And the Apostle Paul speaks about it in that lovely chapter, Romans 8, when he says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. God the Father's ultimate goal for his people was and is to make them like Adam once was, to make them like his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing privilege that is. What an amazing privilege every single one of us has. And therefore, as we close, how glad that should make us to think in just these three reasons this morning that we really are so very special, special to God, our creator. Amen. Oh Lord, we do thank you so much that we can call you our Heavenly Father if we are those who are trusting in your Son, the Lord Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, you have a plan and purpose for our lives. You want us to be more like your Son, the Lord Jesus. You want um, our image to be uh, his image and for that to, to shine for all the world to see and benefit from. Thank you, Lord, for the, uh, the various things that we've been able to consider from your word this morning. We pray that it may have been a help and encouragement to each one of us in different ways. And we thank you, Lord, for the privilege that we have of sitting together under your word and uh, hearing it explained. We, uh, we pray, Lord, that um, if anything has been said amiss, that that will be uh, forgotten and that we may just hold fast to your truth, and that these things will also give us confidence, Lord, as we go out into the world and uh, witness to our friends and colleagues and neighbours that we can share that uh, we have been made by you and that we are so special to you, and we thank you that your great love is upon us. So, Lord, we pray that you'll watch over us through the rest of this day and in the coming week, you'll help us to live our lives for your honour and praise and glory and we give you thanks and praise now in Jesus name. Amen. <laughs>